Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. My guest today is singer-songwriter Holcomb Waller. Today we discuss his upcoming community collaboration project, Requiem Mass, A Queer Divine Right. Having brought this project to Portland, Oregon, and Sydney, Australia, Holcomb next brings it to San Francisco in November of this year. This Requiem piece is an emotional and personal work that is informed by research into the pivotal gay history from the 1980s through the present day. It is driven by community engagement and local community input from experts in liturgical music, queer theory, and faith-based equality initiatives. All are invited from the community to participate and get involved. For more information, visit ybca.org for info on both the free workshops in September, as well as the performances in November. Hi, Holcomb. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So one of the things that I've heard you talk about is your approach to music as total theater. And I wonder if you can tell us more about what that means to you and how you incorporate that into your work. Yeah, you know, that was something that was written about in a little blurb from a United States Artist Award announcement. It was an award I got in 2012. And I sort of took that quote and ran with it because I do think it speaks to how I think about music. I think about the context and purpose of music a lot and how to play with that and expand it. In part because I think I got my start as a singer-songwriter touring bars and clubs and grew tired a little bit of the context and felt like music has such a cathartic ceremonial power, but it also can be so theatrical and narrative. And I really wanted to incorporate things like mise-en-scene and video design, things that I worked on as an art major in college. Mm -hmm. So I began just incorporating those elements and playing with context, you know, creating concerts in theaters that, you know, played with the idea of, of the theatrical concert or taking a theatrical, almost music performance and putting it in a club. And eventually that kind of expanded into different kinds of work, such as the Requiem Project we're talking about today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you have a background in theater? I really don't. Because it seems like you do, based on all the things I've seen you do. Right. I have some experience in theater in that I, you know, when I was pretty old. When I was 29, I moved to Portland and starred in a musical. It was a pretty oh. large 21-person production that very talented kind of theater ingenue named Wade McCollum wrote and starred in. And it was quite a crash course in how to act. <laughs> hmm. And after that, I kind of was so touched by the theater bug that I began studying here with a really interesting guy named Scott Kelman, who had devised performance technique that he felt was trying to recreate the drug and hallucinogen fueled like activist theater of the 60s, 70s and 80s mm -hmm. in downtown New York. You know, the living theater, bread and puppet theater. He was trying to recreate, you know, know, what's his name, Foreman, that kind of thing, but without drugs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I trained with him, which was a performance technique that broke down words and gestures. And it really was almost like a kind of performance jazz. But outside of that study and those experiences, I haven't really trained in theater. I just been a storyteller kind of by trade, mm -hmm. if you would, mm -hmm. through, yeah. through songwriting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hearing that really makes sense based on some of the other performances I've seen, either live or the videos. It's very much a sort of deconstructed theatrical performance, but there's still a lot of theatricality to it. And even in your videos, too. Yeah, that's true. I'm often deconstructing performance in some way mm -hmm. or another. Yeah. So your next project is the Requiem Mass that you're going to be producing in San Francisco in the fall, and you've already done it a couple times in other places. So can you share more about that and how that's going? Yeah, the Requiem Mass, which is now titled Requiem Mass, A Queer Divine Rite, R-I-T-E, is kind of throwback to the fully ceremonial medieval requiem mass form. And I say medieval because the requiem mass became more of a concert form in the 20th century, more rarely, I guess, ceremonially presented in theaters and more commonly musically presented in performance halls. We're sort of taking it back, but 
taken it back into a kind of queer reality that perhaps never existed. And we're using the Requiem to, in fact, invoke the peaceful repose or pray for the peaceful repose, if you pray, of people who've been persecuted for their marginalized position as um, you know, gender diverse or sexually diverse, a particularly often liturgical, uh, I know liturgical, uh, theological persecution. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a concept driven piece that nonetheless actually goes into a church and brings all the smells and the bells and the incense and the candles and the readings and the sermon and the clergy and guest speakers and a community choir and soloists and and creates for the audience and the participants and a real ceremony. We're using the choral singing and the music to actually try to achieve the aims of a requiem mass, which is to you know bring peace to people who have died. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And what do you say to some people who think, gosh, that sounds a little grim? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> just like grow up. I don't know. <laughs> or don't come. Uh-huh. <laughs> because I think in the end, it's not really grim. It's actually quite celebratory and cathartic. I think, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's on in somewhere on the spectrum of dying and everybody has loss and everybody understands what it means for, you know, the history of the sort of patriarchal world order to have persecuted marginalized voices, particularly gear, queer or gender you know, non-conforming voices. And so, you know, it's while it is talking about people who've died and maybe have a sense of unrest because they were not able to live their, as themselves, I think it's also looking forward and saying, let us not, you know, perpetuate this suffering. Let's celebrate these people and bring them rest and think about the future, which I think is really important right now because without big social gestures like this, cultural gestures, I think we really are slipping into a kind of, you know, fascist strongman moment that obviously is very anti-queer, anti-gender non-conforming. Look at Putin, one of the most atrocious anti-gay strongmen on earth standing next to our president and being adored by him. Mm -hmm. So this is a very real moment where I think we really have to kind of join together as community and really uh, think about how we are going to perpetuate, you know, a loving, inclusive future into our, you know, shared reality. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about when I was watching the recording of this before and reading about it some more is that it's almost like a kind of prayer or a spell for our community and our country in a way. I think the piece seeks to reach the community and not necessarily to broaden beyond that. There's a kind of community engagement process built into the piece that seeks to solicit the participation and feedback of individuals and organizations whose missions overlap with the project's mission, such as liturgical music or advocating for LGBTQ people in communities of faith, or they are queer people operating in communities of faith or in churches. And we tried, or they represent a marginalized voice that has an interest in participating and we brought these people in to give us guidance in how to engage within San Francisco so that the piece might appropriately reflect some kind of more localized set of priorities. Mm-hmm. So we very much are focused on San Francisco. And whether it broadens beyond that is really almost a question of documentation and at internet publishing, which I will say that I'm not particularly focused on. I mm-hmm. tend to focus on the, the event and the, and the community participating in that event. So yeah. it is, you know, interesting how it's developing in the city. Mm-hmm. So you've done it before in Portland and Australia. And I wonder how this performance in San Francisco is going to be the same and what's going to be different. Well, each location has been really unique. Portland was where the piece was devised and premiered. Sydney was a kind of festival-based context where we largely recreated the similar process of Portland in a shorter time span. And San Francisco is an expansion of the time span of of the development of the piece to try to really make it reflect the priorities that this group, this round trip table came together and devised and delivered to me to work on. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that in San Francisco, there is just so much emphasis on people being marginalized through displacement, economic displacement, but also racism, sexism, gender nonconforming phobia, queer phobia. There's a lot of discussion about how in the queer community in San Francisco, these things are very divisive in ways that need to be addressed. So they were basically saying, adjust these things. Mm -hmm. So I've been working with partners. I mean, obviously, I'm a cis white man. I can't speak to those things personally, but I can work with other people who might be able to lead in those areas. So there's been a focus on that, in a sense, trying to have the piece which is focusing on this this marginalized population from the past, people who were persecuted in the past, have the piece today reflect the fact that those people still exist among us 
and even in progressive liberal circles, we are not really doing the work that we imagine needs to be done and that we agree needs to be done. The piece was sort of saying, don't put lip service to this. I mean, the, the consensus of the, of the advisory panel, I guess you'd say, was the piece can't just put lip service to this or have like token inclusivity. It has to actually do the work to represent and to have a real conversation with people who represent those marginalized positions and voices and identities. So that's one way that San Francisco really differs in its priorities. That was not really as present in Portland, and it was not as present in Sydney. It just didn't come from the community as in the same way and with the same kind of emphasis as it has in San Francisco. And I have to say, like, in the last three months, I feel like my life has changed on this topic. How so? And particularly with regard to race. But it's true across the board, whether it's gender or transphobia or, but particularly with race, I have to say, I think it's because a lot of the people who I've been working with are representing Black queer perspective or a queer POC perspective. And we have just had a lot of time to talk about it. And there has been, I think to some degree, a sense of trust built so that people are just really talking to me about how they feel and what's going on in a very real way. And I am hearing for the first time in a way that I, maybe I didn't ever hear before, descriptions of racism and access and a sense of not being safe to participate or go places that I've never quite heard before. And the subtlety that within which it operates, even within a progressive liberal context, mm -hmm. and sometimes the overtness with which it operates has shocked me when we really get into the discussions. You know, it's a complicated issue that everyone has a different place in, but the one sort of thesis I've really taken home and that I'm really thinking about with this project in San Francisco is that we as liberal and progressive people think the thoughts and talk the talks and we imagine that there is some work to be done, but we don't actually do it. And if we don't do it, who do we think will do it? Like mm -hmm. Trump voters? No. You know, people who, you know, conservative people? No. They'll like glean like a vibe that we radiate once we do the work. Maybe we'll pull them in our direction. They're not going to do the work. They're doing the opposite. They're working against these ideas. You know, mm -hmm. they're creating fear-based, divisive, context and situations and institutions and practices. And so it's really like been mind blowing. And the other thing I can say is that when you actually are like, okay, let's do this. How do we do this? Let's do this work. Let's make, let's apply this to this project. How do we change the paradigm? How do we make this project not tokenize this? It actually is really, really hard because you, then you discover that there are institutional, cultural, geographic, de facto, like barriers to doing this work. Like there's a reason we don't do the work. It's just not easy. So it's been kind of mind blowing. And I'm just like, I don't know, I guess I'm interested to see what progress the piece makes or how the piece ends up reflecting us trying to do this work. I'm not even, you know, it's very much an in progress thing. Yeah, yeah. And one of the ways that you are trying to make it diverse and inclusive is you offer the free community workshops and inviting anyone at any level and any access to be able to be part of it, not just to be an audience member, but to participate, correct? Yeah, to sing in the choir or to also participate in a rather open-ended way. We try to create an invitation for people to participate and to actually shape the piece. I mean, that's what we do early on with the round table and having our sort of panel of advisors. But then in the workshops themselves, we're also trying to open up a space for people to arrive and, and feel like they can actually take initiative and guide the way it goes. Mm -hmm. I think having public workshops is an important part of the organic process by which we try to invite a community choir to participate and also the way that we try to promote the workshops and provide like transportation access and even the way I've been coached in the workshops language to use I terribly imperfect about how I speak I feel like a talk like a California surfer I I use very gendered like languages, like I say, hey guys, and things like this. And it's been interesting to sort of work on that. Also to share leadership roles among people who represent different types of people so that it's not like everyone's showing up and just listening to me, this like this white queer guy, like talking all, all night. Mm -hmm. And to do these things is like, to me, it hadn't really occurred to me before. And getting this feedback and working with some amazing people on this has really changed my thinking about it. And this is the kind of work you have to do to create a truly inclusive space. And I'm not saying like we're succeeding, I'm saying we're working on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, that is actually one of the direct objectives in San Francisco that 
pretty much differs from Sydney or Portland. In those places, we were like, we had the public workshops. We're like, well, whoever shows up, shows up. And they usually represent a kind of cross-section of the population that also interfaces with that particular performing arts presenter, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe some people from the presenting church. So again, those sort of de de facto cultural geographic kind of forces just sort of dictate who's there. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So rewinding a little bit, can you tell us how you came up with this project initially to begin with? Well, I'd been uh, collaborating musically with a guy named Van Landsberg for decades, and he had gigs in churches and participated musically in churches, everything from being the musical director to being a paid choral singer or choir leader or section leader or choral director. And through that association, I found myself performing at church events. You know, here in Portland, we'd have like a Bob Dylan song night at a church or something. And he even invited me a couple of times to perform in Sunday service. And I just really remarked at how common my experience creating concerts, which I've always thought of as kinds of social cathartic ceremonies, and even theater I've always thought of as a social ceremony. Then I, well, I, I start showing up in churches and my role as a singer or musician or writer is very much in the same vein. I kind of took that experience and started talking with a friend who ended up being the dean of Trinity Cathedral here, which is kind of the sister Episcopalian Cathedral of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And he was very interested in in everything from the way the church is a community space, the way that services are theatrical experiences. You know, it's a very Catholic Episcopalian sort of perspective. So in conversation with him, we thought about, you know, devising this this kind of music ceremony project. And we chose the Requiem Mass because we felt like it was a really rich way to to specifically explore gender diversity and sexual diversity because indeed people have been theologically persecuted. Yeah, that's sort of a broad answer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because family members died in the Holocaust. Because friends and family have not had equal rights based on sexuality. Because I never knew I could live fully as myself and as a full spiritual being, too. Because, because she is the greatest, most loving, most moral person I know. Because I don't always feel safe when I walk out of my house. Because I didn't deserve to be excommunicated. Because I am myself, because I I didn't deserve to be excommunicated, because I am myself.
And I also recall you saying there was something about being inspired to do this after being on a phone bank for marriage equality. How does that tie in? Yeah, I was did a little work on a phone bank at, at an organization here in Portland back when we were trying to get marriage equality passed on a, as a ballot initiative, a voter ballot initiative. And they were having telephone volunteers call people who had been determined to be not supportive of marriage equality, but possibly open to it. Hmm. And this was a group. So I called, you know, dozens of people who, and all of them referenced their church as the reason they didn't support it. But when you spoke to them, they were like, well, I don't really know why the church doesn't support it, but it's just what we do, you know, but they were very open to talking about it. And I just realized at that time, I was like, oh, uh, we need to do something in the church. (laughs) That was just sort of the idea was, well, we should create a project that creates material and performance within a church context, because it doesn't sound like there's maybe enough of a queer voice in the canon of liturgical music. And I thought, well, I'm a musician and lots of non-religious musicians have been contributing to liturgical music for like millennium. So I just thought I'd do it too. (laughs) You know what I mean? So it's sort of like a subvert way to sort of sneak into the places where these people who were on the fence about supporting queer political issues and try to give them a different perspective, maybe. Sure. It's definitely subversive, but I wouldn't say we're sneaking in anywhere. We're just walking right in the front door with (laughs) Uh our rainbow flags waving and just Uh being like, this church is ours. Yeah, yeah. But obviously we couldn't do that in any church. There's many non-affirming churches. And early in the project, the idea was, oh, we want to bring this to the non-affirming churches. Hmm. And I have to say that was not constructive. And again, one of the interesting things about San Francisco that that I've been learning a lot of this whole time in the project, that there's a lot of work to be done just in the affirming and liberal and progressive spaces. But in San Francisco, I feel like the one thing I really feel like is now almost like a personal thesis and mission is just that the progressive liberal community is divided by racism and Mm -hmm. issues of gender and sexuality in ways that destroy our political force. Mm -hmm. And... I think until we decide we're going to do the work to figure that out, no one else is going to, and they're going to continue capitalizing on the division. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a thing to look at directly. Mm -hmm. And again, I have to say, if you just look at it from a numbers perspective, like black, white race relations within the progressive liberal community suck so bad. Mm -hmm. There's so much misunderstanding. And when you throw gender uh, and sexual diversity into the mix, you come up against cultural differences that are profound and need to be understood and looked at by everyone if we're going to stop fascism in its tracks. This is literally how I feel. And it's really retrenched me into a commitment to the progressive ideals that a lot of conservative people describe themselves as fascist, which is to literally look at all of these progress, all of these marginalized voices and understand the ways in which we cannot accept discrimination anymore within our ranks. Mm-hmm. implicit, explicit, anything, institutionalized, socioeconomic, you know, justice related, environmentally related, historically, obviously related. So we just can't, we have to figure it out and do the work. Mm-hmm. And if we don't, it's not going to work out for the liberal progressive agenda ever. Yeah. Anyway, that's, the, I know I keep saying it again and again, but that's the thing that San Francisco as a community really reflects. I mean, it's an issue. <laughs> it's on the table. I think yeah, people, no, people know it. It's important and it's talked a lot about here a lot and I'm sure in other cities as well. And so I'm glad that, you know, people are talking to you about it and you're doing what you can through this piece to bring that in. So thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Can you share more about what the music might be like for people who are curious to know, well, what is this performance going to be like? Is it going to be like other stuff that you've done? Is it going to be more traditionally religious? What does it sound like? That kind of thing. Well, there's the music that exists, which we may edit, adapt, or change. But the music that exists for it features the church organ and an eight-person ensemble that is kind of a mix of classical and pop instruments. Like there's an electric guitar and bass player. There's a drum kit, but he's also a percussionist. Mm -hmm. There's French horns. There's a violinist. There's a flute and a keyboardist. So the music is all in choral based music with vocal soloists. We also explore some plain song chant 
And there is a hymn where the audience is invited to participate as they would any service where there's a hymn. It's definitely rooted in liturgical music. The mass is a form that has certain texts for each section. And based on how you choose and string those sections together, you create the ceremony. And so those, those texts are all these Latin-based texts. So I reinterpret them and I match them up sometimes with other sources, psalms and other religious texts, in some cases, some poetry by queer artists. So I take some liberties with each section and each section is supposed to kind of execute a different moment in the, the time arc of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. So it is beautiful choral music in a very large, you know, airplane hangar sized European cathedral. It's what I'm not quite sure is of yet is how that stylistically will shift based on the kind of singers and participants who really come to the foreground. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're at this point in the calendar we yet exactly know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know if that's if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So shifting gears as we wrap up a little bit, can you share with us a person, practice, or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish? So the first person that comes to mind there is Joe Good, the San Francisco-based choreographer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's also kind of a writer and a theater maker. I've had a chance to work with him and take workshops with him and collaborate with him. And I think his approach to making work and to representing his identity as a gay man had definitely inspired the way that I moved into making using music as a way of exploring a broader performative space for myself. So I don't know. That's the first person that comes to mind. Are you familiar with Joe Good? A little bit, yeah. 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 He's a piece up right now in San Francisco. He often does site-based work, which is really inspiring. And yeah, he teases out themes from his dancers and performers, and he lets them bring their identities and their own writing and their own movements and into the process. Mm -hmm. And he's editing and kind of making calling shots, but he really works with other people's participation in a way that I found really inspiring. So nice. Yeah. So how can people find out more about the workshops to get involved for those in the Bay Area and to find out about the Requiem when it's coming up. Yeah, I mean, I think if anyone's interested in workshops, we have four workshops in the second half of September on Tuesday and Thursday evenings in Grace Cathedral. And we meet in one of the big halls off the side entrance off California. And on some nights, we move into the cathedral space for the later part of the workshop, which is fun. And those are on the Yerba Buena Center website. And they're on Facebook. So the easiest way is to just Google Holcomb Waller Choral Workshop or Holcomb choral music series or Holcomb Choral YBCA. Anything with my name, the word choral and Grace Cathedral or YBCA will get you to the workshops I've found. I'll look those up and put them on the show notes so people can find them as well. Yeah. And they're free. You can sign up, but you can also just show up. We learned different sections of the, pro of the piece. And we also explore choral singing as more like an ensemble experience, sort of listening to each other, letting ourselves find our entrances together as a group, instead of like a conductor kind of pointing and gesturing, more really tuning into each other and exploring the kind of magical, amazing, self-organizing powers of humans and applying it to music. Um, so they're fun. And it's also a way to just get a feeling of whether the project seems interesting to you. Um, the actual performance is November 16th and 17th. And so much of the learning is done October kind of casually. And then the two weeks prior to the performance, we have a couple weekend, you know, focused weekend rehearsals and evening rehearsals for anyone who might like to participate. And that's going to be great fun. It, it's that's when we really, I don't know, put the show on the road. We bring a huge lighting and sound rig into the space. And we there's a scenic designer who works and creates kind of this very large scale installation of hanging letters in the space. And we get to move through the space and kind of own the space in a way that's pretty fun and intense. So if, if anybody wants to participate in that, it's kind of the first couple of weeks of November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And for people who are not in the area, is there going to be a recording or anything like that that people might be able to see at some point in the future? Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> There is a recording of Portland. There's a lot of excerpts from the Portland piece on Vimeo. So if you Google those, they, they turn up. And yeah, I, I hope we document San Francisco. There's two nights, so we'll see. All right. 
Yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing it and seeing it when it's here in a couple months. And uh, thanks for being here and sharing with us about it. Yeah. Thanks for chatting with me about it. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time.